Today we are going to start on image restoration. Now before we go over to this uh, new topic, just a few things pertaining to the last class's discussion which was on the uh, transform domain filtering. There are uh, two corrections which I would like to make. Firstly that uh, we were discussing about the zonal masks and in zonal masks we also considered the inverse Gaussian filtering. Okay, where we have said that we will be checking, I mean we will be taking a zonal mask of this nature, GKL, which is equal to exponential to the power k square plus l square divided by 2 sigma square, where k and l are the indices in the frequency domain and sigma is nothing but the sigma of the Gaussian function. And in this expression we have k and l lying between 0 and capital N minus 1 where the image size is capital N by capital N. Now for this function, okay, this is clearly an inverse Gaussian function what we get over here and the nature of this function should be like this that uh, if we start, I mean we take any one of them like we say we take uh, k on this axis, okay and we take GKL on this axis or rather let us take only the one dimensional profile because two dimensional profile will be nothing but an extension of this. So there we will be getting a function of this nature. Okay, It will not saturate. Okay, In the last class we had shown that it was going into a uh, uh, limiting uh, value of GKL that will not happen because it is very clear from the expression of this GKL that it will keep on increasing as we increase uh, the values of uh, K and L. Alright, so this is the first thing which uh, I wanted to tell you. And the second is pertaining to the uh, homomorphic filtering and some confusions were there regarding the dynamic range uh, pertaining to the homomorphic filtering. Now in homomorphic filtering what exactly we were doing, if you recollect, we were having the uh, original image, okay, U over here, and then we were passing it through this block where we were doing A U A transpose. Thereby, we were coming to the V domain. That's to say, we were coming to the transform domain where A was the unitary transformation, and thereafter we were taking the logarithm or the magnitude part of the VKL. So we were taking log of mod VKL, all right, and the phase component was there as it is. That's to say, exponential to the power j theta KL. That was there as it is, and then we were calling this output as S of KL, and thereby and thereafter we were doing A inverse S A transpose inverse. Okay. And the output of that was the substrum, which was CMN. Now, in this case, what happens is that clearly uh, from the image domain we are going over to the uh, transform domain, and in transform domain we are taking the logarithm. Now, as a result of logarithm, clearly in the transform domain, because S of KL, mind you, is still in the transform domain. In the transform domain, the dynamic range is decreasing. Okay, we have clearly said there that. Uh, so that this uh, log of uh, VKL that uh, does not become uh, minus infinity, we won't allow VKL to be equal to zero. Or rather, a very common practice is to add a value of one to the existing values of VKL so that it, it doesn't go to the case of VKL equal to zero. So S of KL clearly the dynamic range decreases, and when we are taking the inverse transformation of that and coming over to the substrum domain. Okay, there the dynamic range increases. Okay, so that is one observation. Okay, which uh, I wanted to point out in connection with the dynamic range uh, aspects of the homomorphic filtering. This was our total homomorphic filtering block diagram. Anyway, now uh, in the last few classes, what we were primarily doing was we started with the discussions on the image enhancement. And as I told you uh, in the introductory lectures of image enhancement that there the basic purpose was to 
uh, accentuate or rather to, to extract some specific features out of the image okay uh, even if the image quality is not so good like we consider the aspects of uh, contrast enhancement if our objective is to have an image having very clear contrast we also discussed how to uh, do the histogram equalization we also uh, had a discussion on the um, uh, local averaging or rather the low pass filtering uh, or the effects of medium filters and thereafter the uh, high pass filters or age extraction process basically in all that there were certain things which were in common okay firstly that we were not exactly knowing that why the image okay with which we started okay the uh, original image why that was not up to the mark I mean rather we did not have any knowledge as to why it deviated from that of an ideal image or rather what caused that degradation aspect that we did not consider rather there was no such mathematical modeling which we did about the degradation process present okay and we were quite satisfied after extracting the desired features of the image now desired features I mean as long as we could extract the desired features by applying the image enhancement uh, techniques which we had discussed okay we were happy and satisfied and we did not uh, consider that whether there is going to be an overall improvement as compared to the original image or if it is degraded due to certain phenomena we were not making really an attempt to correct those degradations okay but basically that is what we should attempt to do if any such images okay are severely degraded there are various reasons for degradation okay now say for example uh, you must have seen that uh, when we take images from a moving vehicle okay or rather we take the images of a moving vehicle rather to say that when there is a relative displacement between the camera and the object which is being imaged okay there we will find that there is a uh, definite amount of uh, blurring or distortion that takes place okay uh, and uh, if we get such kind of an image then we definitely know that it is taken from a moving vehicle having this much of velocity etc the question that one can ask is that is it possible that we mathematically model the degradation process okay and thereafter we try to do a filtering okay that corrects for that particular degradation process because if it is possible to mathematically model the degradation process okay then applying inverse of that we must know how to undo that also okay so that is exactly what the theme of or what the basic objective of image restoration is and that is going to be our next topic of discussion image restoration right now firstly let us understand that why at all an image gets degraded because we were all the time saying that normally the images are degraded okay now what exactly causes that degradation okay and at what level is that degradation coming is it coming uh, at the sensor level itself okay that means to say whenever we get the image from the sensor output the sensor could be an electronic sensor it could be an electro optical sensor it could be a purely optical sensor whatever the sensor might be okay there is uh, I, I mean whether the degradation is because of the sensing mechanism of the image or whether the degradation is because of uh, some processing of the image okay that is something which we should understand but what happens in most of the cases is that the degradation is due to sensing environment itself now I am generalizing and calling it as sensing environment uh, degradation because that encompasses various type of uh, causes okay for the image degradation 
Now let me ask you, I mean from your uh, uh, common knowledge about the various imaging processes, can you uh, name some of the common degradation causes, okay? Can you name one, uh, one by one, okay? Let us uh, uh, invite the uh, opinion from you. What do you think can cause degradation? Just name one. Poor illumination. Yes, please? Poor illumination. Poor illumination, okay. So rather to say, uh, I should say that there is an amount of, I mean I can generalize and put it under sensor noise, okay. Simply because uh, what happens is that if there is a poor illumination condition as somebody pointed out, it happens very frequently and in many type of images it is like that. Like whenever we are taking the image without adequate lighting or there are some sensors like say for example in infrared sensor, thermal imaging, okay. If you observe the output of an in infrared sensor, okay, normally you will find that it is a very poor contrast images because of the sensor sensitivity, okay. Now any uh, uh, very poor contrast image, if the sensor is highly sensitive, then we can uh, get uh, a good contrast uh, image out of a even low illumination condition also, okay. So basically let us put that under a, under the sensor noise. What is? Improper focusing. Improper focusing, that's excellent, okay. Improper focusing. It happens many a times. A number of times you must have observed out of focus images. And how does an out of focus image look like? It looks blurred, isn't it? There is uh, the sharpness is lost in an out. Uh, I mean, I mean in an uh, uh, out of focus image. Okay, we don't get a clear boundary. Okay, everything becomes quite hazy or blurred. Okay, so that is uh, one very common phenomenon. What else? Okay, one uh, cause I have already stated. Okay while giving the example, that is to say, relative object camera motion. Okay. Now, what else? We can also uh, state that one of the causes for degradation is uh, in many of the uh, sensor images, okay, is atmospheric turbulence. And as I was uh, telling you yesterday, while uh, talking about the uh, um, uh, transform domain uh, filtering, we also discussed that inverse Gaussian. Okay. Now, why we take, uh, why we took inverse Gaussian function? Simply because the atmospheric turbulence can be normally modeled by a Gaussian blurring process. Okay. So. Uh, in order to correct the effect of Gaussian blurring, we applied an inverse Gaussian filter in order to uh, correct those degradation. Okay, so these are just some of the reasons. Okay, the list is not exhaustive, but these are some of the common reasons. Okay, for image degradation. So given all these reasons for image degradation, okay, what should we attempt to do? Firstly, there must be two things which we must do, okay, and it's very important to do it with a good amount of efficiency. Given the sense of noise, improper focusing, out of uh, relative object camera motion, atmospheric turbulence, and uh, all these uh, various factors, there may be other optical uh, factors coming as well, okay. Now, given all this, we must know that is it possible to mathematically model the degradation processes. Now, so we must look for, in order to have an efficient image restoration, we must have a very good mathematical modeling. But mind you, the task is not that easy because Many a times you will find that while trying to do the mathematical modeling, okay, if you were trying to do the mathematical modeling very correctly, okay, 
you have to uh, apply okay a number of non-linearities okay there may be a number of um, uh, too many variables which are coming in too many variables which are difficult to handle okay l l like this there could be a number of factors okay that cause the image degradation and doing an accurate mathematical modeling is very difficult so in such cases what we may do is that we may go in for a simpler mathematical modeling at times one may feel that such mathematical modelings are becoming oversimplified okay but still uh, as long as some kind of an approximated mathematical modeling is also there okay even though it may be simplified okay if it is possible to apply the inverse filtering of that okay then we can get at least a better image if not the if not an ideal one if not the uh, same image what it should have been okay because it's very difficult I mean it's a really difficult task to properly do the uh, modeling of the image degradation process so the first thing is an efficient mathematical modeling and the aspect number two is to design an efficient filter which corrects for those degradation processes because a lot of times you may find that you may do a very good mathematical modeling but ultimately the filter okay the filter function which you get okay might be an unrealizable filter function okay and for such cases what you do again you do some amount of approximations okay so that you reduce some criteria the least mean squares or any such uh, minimization or optimization criteria you apply so that at least you get okay a result which is better than the uh, given image or rather to say you at least try to correct the degradation to the best extent possible so two things again I summarize two things are involved number one a very appropriate modeling of the degradation process number two a proper modeling or rather a realization of the filter to correct for those degradations anyway so uh, we will uh, look into all these aspects one by one and uh, to begin with we start with the first aspect that is to say in finding out a degradation model but mind you we are not going into any complicated model I mean, although you I mean one can argue that in uh, real life situation the modeling is going to be much more complicated than what we are going to describe but uh, at least it is a simplified model which one can implement okay or one can easily think of okay and that model is like this we have the image written as f x y over here okay which we are getting as an input and mind you f of x y is what the ideal image should have been okay now why the ideal image is becoming non-ideal why it is becoming degraded okay we can do some mathematical modeling like this let us have a block okay and that block is having a transfer function which can be described by some operator h okay that block is having an operator h so that the output of this block we can describe as h of f f f x y okay we don't know right now that what this function h is okay that we will see that what approximations do we make for this h function then okay uh, after that we are going to have some amount of noise okay which will degrade it further firstly that there is an there is a transfer function in the system okay it may realize a low pass filtering it may realize a high pass filtering it may realize a band pass filtering or I mean uh, many odd combinations okay might be there so 
this h functions nature we really don't know but on top of it we have some additive noise so we have yet another block okay where we can insert the additive noise and let us call this as eta x y all right so the output of this block along with this additive noise eta x y okay we are calling as the as g of x y where g of x y is nothing but the degraded image g of x y is the degraded image f of x y was what that earlier uh, i mean what that ideal image was now what happens in our imaging system we are going to get this g of x y all right we are going to get this g of x y as input to our system okay and we should realize our system or design our system okay with the full knowledge of this uh, operator h okay and some statistical knowledge about this noise eta okay uh, uh, now uh, with all these ideas given g x y as an input to our system we must reconstruct or we must try to recover the image f of x y we may not recover f of x y exactly we may recover what we may describe as f hat of x y we may estimate f hat of x y okay in such a manner that the error between this f of x y and f hat of x y is minimized all right so now we are not bothered about that process the uh, filter realizations and all these things we will come little later but at least our proper mathematical modeling as to how we arrive from f of x y to g of x y all right and that mathematical modeling in order to do that mathematical modeling we would like to make some assumptions the assumption number one is that h this this block h okay it is a linear system okay so the first assumption is that the system is linear what do you understand by a linear system a linear system simply means that where the principle of superposition can be applied that means to say if i have two functions one is f1 xy the other is f2 of xy and i take f1 of xy plus f2 of xy and apply this operator h on that then the output will become equal to h of f1 of xy plus h of f2 of xy the individual outputs then summed up is the same as taking the sum of the outputs and then operating on h okay so that is the principle of linearity which we will make use of the second assumption which we are making about this is that <coughs> the system is homogeneous so it is a linear homogeneous system and what is the definition of homogeneous if we have instead of f of xy we take k some constant k multiplied by f of xy okay and apply the operator h on that okay then h operated on k into f of x y will be same as k multiplied by h operated on f x y alone okay that's the principle of homogeneity which we will make use of and the third property and again a very important property which we will make use of is that it is the system is shift invariant that is to say if we vary the position of x y okay then the uh, response okay is not going to change okay it's not it's not dependent upon the uh, spatial position rather it is shift invariant so with these three assumptions about this operator h okay these are the assumptions which we are making about the operator h okay we can do a mathematical modeling now before we do that okay we start with the input function itself the input function is being considered as f of xy the f of xy can be written very easily in terms of the uh, 
impulse response, okay, uh, which is, as you know, that in terms of the impulse function, if we take the impulse function as delta xy, okay, where delta xy is nothing but an impulse function located at the position uh, x equal to 0 and y equal to 0, okay. So that it is, uh, 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 sorry, I mean, delta of xy means that at the location xy, the output is going to be uh, unity and at all other positions it is going to be zero. So that is the impulse function that we take. And we can write f of xy, okay, in terms of the impulse function as, we can take it as, some, uh, as double integral between the bits minus infinity to plus infinity f of alpha beta, where alpha beta are some variables, delta x minus alpha y minus beta d alpha d beta, okay, where the integrations are performed with respect to alpha and beta, and we consider this uh, function as f of alpha beta, then we consider the um, uh, impulse functions f of x minus alpha y minus beta okay so this will give rise to f of xy all right now for the time being i mean although we are not going to consider it um, uh, all the time but for the time being if we assume for simplification we assume that eta xy that's to say the additive noise is equal to zero okay if this is equal to zero then uh, how we can write our uh, function g of xy? Then the function g of xy, I can write simply as h of f of xy. Okay. Normally I was putting h of f xy plus I was putting, I mean according to our uh, degradation model like this, it is very clear that g of xy should have been this plus eta of xy, but since eta of xy is assumed to be 0, I can straight away take it as g of xy equal to h of f xy, and uh, because the system is linear, because h is linear, okay, then the linearity uh, uh, principle can be transferred on the integration uh, operator as well, and Thereby, we can consider this to be minus infinity to plus infinity h of this entire uh, function f of alpha beta delta x minus alpha y minus beta, okay, then d alpha d beta. And again, since uh, uh, f of alpha beta is independent uh, of the position x y, okay we can take it out of this h operator by the principle of homogeneity we can take this f alpha beta out having f alpha beta over here and h delta x minus alpha comma y minus beta d alpha d beta okay now we are very much concerned with this term h of delta x minus alpha y minus beta okay and let us write that this is i mean this is obviously going to be a function of x alpha y beta all these four things so we can write a new function h okay i write it as small h okay x alpha y beta okay and that i define as h of delta x minus alpha y minus beta all right so by writing it this way it means that if eta of xy okay is equal to zero that's to say the additive noise component is equal to zero then what this h x alpha y beta indicates is that it's the response of capital h to to what to an unit impulse to an impulse of strength one at what coordinates at the coordinate alpha beta so it's the response of unit impulse at the coordinate alpha beta okay 
and uh, uh, this is so this h function which we just now defined is nothing but an impulse response function okay is nothing but an impulse function the response of the system to unit impulse this is being written as h of x alpha y beta okay now in optics this uh, what this delta function is it's a point of light okay and that is why this function okay h of x alpha y beta is being described as what you know it it's being described as the point spread function or PSF in short form so h of x alpha y beta is also described as a point spread function if impulse is the point function then h x alpha y beta is nothing but the point spread function or in short form p s f all right now since we have assumed that capital h is position invariant okay then obviously h of x alpha y beta is going to be same as that of h x minus alpha 0 y minus beta 0 isn't it i just give a shift of alpha and beta okay alpha to x and beta to y okay now that since these are zero zeros i can describe it simply as h of x minus alpha y minus beta okay and this is also equal to h of delta x minus alpha y minus beta because by our definition h of x y x alpha y beta is equal to this delta x alpha x minus alpha y minus beta taking the h operator on this okay this and this are by definition same and because it is shift invariant or other position invariant we can write h of delta x minus alpha y minus beta equal to small h of x minus alpha y minus beta and now if we substitute this relation into this integral okay g of x y equal to f of alpha beta h of this expression if we instead of h of delta x minus alpha y minus beta we substitute this then what result is our g of x y is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity f of alpha beta h of x minus alpha y minus beta d alpha d beta and what does this integral indicate it indicates the convolution so that means to say the degradation is being approximated by a is being modeled as a convolution integral with the point state function so this is nothing but the convolution integral all right now uh, <coughs> if we would like to introduce the additive noise in our model then we can add the term I mean this integral being there we can add the term eta of xy okay to it so that the degradation model also takes care of the additive noise so this is the complete model that we get okay for the um, uh, degradation but what our basic assumptions there was that number one it's a linear homogeneous and shift invariance system now one can argue that in most of the cases such assumptions are a bit oversimplified because firstly that many of these uh, h functions 
are nonlinear functions. Okay, so nonlinearities could be there. Then uh, shift invariant again. Not all degradations are shift invariant. There are a number of degradations, okay, which are very much shift variant, okay. Like say, so for example, the mismatch of focus, misalignment of focus is one of them. You'll find that it is heavily position dependent. The effect of blurring, okay, that changes from position to position. So there, so it's not that all these assumptions, okay, are always valid. But there is a practical consideration. If we try to take our model, okay, with all these complications of nonlinearity, shift variance, and all these things, the mathematical model that results is too complicated. Okay. Again, the, the most difficult task thereafter is to uh, de describe or rather to uh, realize a filter, okay, which corrects for those degradation tosses. So at least uh, to a reasonable extent, one can take, I mean as far as possible, try to take the uh, linear uh, functions, okay, linear shift invariant functions to model the degradations, okay. Now, uh, degradations for some common uh, uh, causes, okay, they have been already worked out by people, okay. And it's not difficult to find out a degradation model. Now, one simple uh, way of finding degradation uh, of finding the degradation model, I tell you, is uh, when there is an when there is a relative motion between the object and the camera. So we are going to consider that, and we are going to see that how we arrive at a degradation model, which can be described as a linear homogeneous shifting variant system, right? So let us consider. We consider the point spread function okay, of some typical degradations. And there the number one example which we take is regarding the motion blurring when there is a relative displacement between the object and the camera. So, let us say that we have an object, okay, whose position is at u of x, y, okay, and this is, and this object is moving uniformly in the x direction with a velocity v. So, we have a velocity v, okay, in x direction for this object all right and let us say that we are imaging this particular uh, object okay with a camera whose aperture time is equal to capital T so capital T we are taking as the aperture time of the camera Now what happens really? For the duration of capital T, okay, the aperture of the camera is open, okay, and that is why whatever motion is there within the interval zero to capital T, okay, the final output, okay, the final image output will be nothing but an integration of all these individual outputs taking place for u of x y, and mind you, this object position is at u of x y is moving uniformly in x direction with the velocity v okay so we can describe the observed image okay rather the observed image can be modeled as g of x y this can be written as 1 upon t since it's an averaging u of x not x, it should be, shall I write u of x, y, x minus v, t, okay, because the object is moving with the velocity v, okay, so we are taking x minus v, t, comma, y, and this will be integrated over, I mean with respect to time, t, 
Okay? And what should be the limits of integration? 0 to capital T because capital T is the aperture time. Okay? Now, we, I mean, in order to uh, simplify our definition, okay, we define a parameter alpha as v into t. So that is, instead of writing v into t, we will be writing alpha, okay, and we also substitute instead of v into capital T, we write it as alpha zero, okay. So if we make this substitutions, okay, and instead of integrating with respect to t, we integrate with respect to alpha, okay. All that we get is like this, okay. Then v of xy becomes equal to, okay, uh, rather g of xy becomes equal to, but before we describe this g of xy, okay, I'd like to introduce the definition of one very commonly available function and that function is the rectangular function. Now, the rectangular function is defined as follows. The rectangular function, if its argument is x, okay, then rectangular function is equal to 1 for mod of x less than or equal to half, okay, and this is equal to 0, okay, for mod of x greater than half. This is the definition of the rectangular function and if we incorporate the definition of the rectangular function for this u of x minus vt, okay, very simply we would like to uh, introduce the definition of this uh, rectangular function because the limits of integration are from 0 to capital T. But if we model it in terms of a rectangular function, then we can change the limits from minus infinity to plus infinity and describe this by the rectangular function. Okay? And by making all these variable substitutions, alpha equal to vt and alpha 0 equal to v times capital T, okay, what results is as follows. This uh, becomes equal to 1 upon alpha 0 integral 0 to alpha 0 u of x minus alpha y d alpha. This is simply we are getting by substituting alpha for vt. Simply substitute alpha for vt, you get this expression and instead of uh, writing as 1 by capital T, you just say here 1 by alpha 0, okay, because alpha 0 is nothing but v into capital T. And this can now be described as 1 upon alpha 0 and within a double integration limits of minus infinity to plus infinity, describe it by a rectangular function al whose argument is alpha by alpha 0 minus half. This minus half is coming very clearly. Okay, You can see that this is there in the definition of the rectangular function itself. This, if I multiply by delta beta, if I multiply it by delta beta, then I am introducing one more variable beta over here. Okay, And obviously, I can introduce this variable delta, uh, I mean I can introduce the impulse function delta beta, okay, with beta and in that case again I, I can write the integration limits from minus infinity to plus infinity because it's going to be unity only at beta is equal to zero and it's going to be zero otherwise, okay. So this is the way I can write this g of x by function, alright, and in that case what is going to be the point spread function for the motion blurring. Can you point out what is the point spread function? The point spread function is simply this. The, 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 the point spread function is very simply this function, okay, which I can describe as follows. So the PSF is given by h of x y equals 1 by alpha 0 rectangular function of x by alpha 0 minus half delta y if I take this as h of x y 
and if I try to plot the point slope function, it looks like this. It's, uh, it's the direction of x, okay, and this is y, and this is our h of x y in this axis. So then, here I will be getting it as alpha zero, and the amplitude of this will be one upon alpha zero. So this is the nature of the point spread function. So this we got for the motion blurring, and like this, okay. Although the uh, degradations for other processes may not be as simplified as this uh, motion blurring, okay. But at least all the other degradation causes, okay, can be mathematically modeled, okay, in this particular fashion. Okay. Now, any uh, questions? U x y no. Uh, I have multiplied it by the uh, impulse function. Actually, it depends on the value of u x y. Only if you assume u x y is unity, yes, is present. That means impulse resonance is supported by an impulse vector u x y. Correct. I mean, uh, on, 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 otherwise it becomes I mean multiplied by some factor. That's all. Yes. Anything else? So we will uh, take up the discussions on the image uh, uh, respiration filter designs from the next class. Thank you.